dear listeners, and welcome to another episode of Extra Extra. It's all about whiskey. I'm your host, Jason Johnson Yellen, aka a bunch of things. And I'm joined in this podcast with the wonderful, the inimitable, the always thinking, Joshua Hatton, aka Whiskey Cherub. Hi, Joshua. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you letting our listeners know that I've always, always got my thinking cap on. Yes, there was definitely a, an intended pregnant pause after all was thinking, so I didn't actually have to fill in what you're always thinking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't need to specify, just just that I'm always thinking. Always thinking. Mm-hmm. So on Extra Extra, you or I bring a story to the attention of the other. Mm-hmm. We read it in the first half, we riff on it in the second half, and sometimes... We do something else entirely. Mm. And today we're going to do a something else entirely, which is we each have a story. Neither one did we think could really fill out a full episode, but they're kind of interesting. They're, they're something that you and I would talk about together on a Monday morning. So, yep. so here we are. So we'll give you the first half of the podcast. I'll take the second half of the podcast and then we'll get out of here. At least we will try. To get out of here in a tight 30 to 35 minutes. All right. So you're, you're handing it off to me? Yeah. What are you bringing to our attention today, Joshua Hatton? Always well, got, thinking. <laughs> I've got a, a story here. So I, I, I think we may have mentioned this before. I, I subscribe to the Mark Brown report. And it's, it's an article that, that comes into your inbox. And it's, it's specifically for people in the industry, right? And it'll come into your inbox a few times a week, usually at around three in the morning. Uh, Mark Brown, if you don't know who that is, I mean, Mark Brown is Mr. Buffalo Trace. He is the the CEO of that, of, well, of of Sazerac, right? Of of the big thing. So so anyway, he he compiles a list of stories. And this is one of the stories on, on one of the more recent emails that came in on uh, the email came in on June 4. The story is from June 3. And the source is from thehill.com. And the title reads, United Joins Carriers Scaling Back In-Flight Alcohol Service. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, it doesn't say who the who the author of the article is, at least not in this email, but I imagine if you went to thehill.com and and just looked for that headline, you'll find the author. So the story begins, United Airlines this week became the latest U.S. carrier to limit its alcohol service on flights amid reports of unruly passengers on other airlines. (laughs) (laughs) Which is an interesting take, right? People yeah. aren't behaving over there, so we're going to change something over here. Yeah, and as they were doing it, I guarantee you they were saying, this is why we can't have good things. This is, is why it? we can't is have good nice things. Continues, uh, alcoholic beverages such as wine, beer, and hard seltzer will now be served on domestic flights longer than 800 miles. They were previously available for flights over 200 miles. Both Southwest Airlines and American Airlines announced recently that they would also be limiting alcohol service on their flights. American Airlines said it would not be lifting its suspension on alcoholic drinks until September due to, quote, disturbing situations on board aircraft, end quote, in which passengers have allegedly assaulted staff members on flights. That's just craziness. That's bad news, Bears. The next paragraph starts off with a quote. It says, let me be clear. American Airlines will not tolerate assault or mistreatment of our crews. Managing Director of American Airlines Flight Service Training and Administration Brady Burns told crew members in a letter this week. Southwest's head of in-flight operations, Sonia LaCour, said in a letter obtained by CNN last week that, quote, based on the rise in passenger disruptions in flight, I've made the decision to reevaluate the restart of alcohol service on board. 
Most airlines hmm. suspended alcohol service after the pandemic hit to limit how often passengers take off their masks and to reduce the number of in- interactions between passengers and flight attendants. Heavy fines... Not, have, not to mention trips to the bathroom. Well, there is that, right? Uh, heavy fines have been levied against multiple unruly passengers who assaulted, that's a strong word, assaulted flight crew members. And this is, and this is the last little uh, paragraph slash really just sentence. Uh, Federal Aviation Administration Chief Steve Dixon announced in January that the agency would be adopting a zero-tolerance policy toward bad behavior on flights and would pursue fines and jail time instead of issuing warnings. It's a scary situation to have an assault happen up in the sky, right? You, You don't just park and throw somebody off. Right, You've, there's a whole procedure to get them under control, mm-hmm. back in their seat, mm-hmm. get diverted to a local airport so you can get that bird on the ground, as I think mm-hmm. captains famously said in the seventies, and and so there's there's a lot to it. It must be an incredibly expensive endeavor to reroute a plane, then get all your passengers booked onto other flights. There was just one over the weekend where there was a chap trying to gain access to the cockpit on on what? some internal US domestic flight. And was he and drunk? He was, what, what was the s- scenario there? There was only reading between the lines mm-hmm. and you're certainly seeing a few of these where someone's taken a little sleepy medicine but then the sleepy medicine hasn't kicked in quite fast enough. And so they've taken a wee alcoholic beverage on top of the sleepy medicine. And then uh, and then all hell breaks loose. Uh, and so I, I'm not saying that was the situation. I'm just yeah, saying that's yeah, something I yeah. have seen. Uh, we had it last year where there was a, a professional golfer returning from a, a competition in first class. And he mm. did exactly that. He combined sleepy medicine with alcohol end up urinating on other passengers in first class. In his sleep or the combination just kind of messed in with him? In that fugue state, right? Where you're yeah. you're neither one thing nor the other. You're neither asleep nor awake. You're just unruly. Um, but here's, here's my question to you. Yeah. How many people do you think are actually buying the booze that is passed around or goes up and down the aisle. And how many do you think are just pulling from their little carry-on that they've got underneath them? Well, that is that is a very good question. And it's funny, and, and, and we don't want to go down this rabbit hole at all. But when you posed that question, I saw... I... I, I see a dotted line to the to the to the gun question and gun permits, right? You know, they they talk mm-hmm. about well if you if you limit the amount of legal guns on the streets, it should limit the amount of gun violence. But there's a percentage of gun violence that's solely attributed to legally acquired guns. And so I think in both cases well, to answer your question, I, I don't know what the answer to that is. But I, and, and at the same time, I don't necessarily think that limiting the sale of alcohol in flight will limit what this article is talking about. A true limitation is not allowing the nips, right, the minis to come along on, on carry-ons, which, which you could see is a potential next step. I mean, not... I've brought many minis with me, but I never bring them in my on-flight thing. Unless I should take, I should take that back. I've taken some to do cask sample sessions, only to realize the air pressure in there and everything. You know, it's a terrible environment to do cask sample 
checks. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so I just promptly put them away saying, now this, there's no way this whiskey tastes like this. Moving on. Um, <laughs> Don't mind me just sampling <laughs> through a bunch of cast samples in the air. <laughs> but uh, As you were. so what, while I can't directly answer your question, I envision the next step is airlines joining forces to say, you know, we're, we're not going to be allowing this anymore. And to, to help us out, uh, TSA, mm. yes, allow people to bring their toiletries. Don't allow them to bring their nips. You know, there, mm. there's, there's, there's something nice about having a, a gin and tonic or two and just shutting your eyes and waking up at your destination, but when you're just getting pissed drunk and being an absolute a hole, this is why Terrible. we can't have nice things. This is exactly Absolutely. why we can't have nice things. Something interesting is happening right now, and and why I'm glad you you brought in this article is here we are talking about alcohol use on flights and the the type of behaviour it's leading to. Mm-hmm. We've now seen uh, a a ban, a partial ban, a suggested ban, some councils in Scotland banning drinking in the park Mm -hmm. because, you know, it's lockdown, you can't go inside a bar, but they would go to the park and maybe get a little unruly and then leave litter everywhere Uh, and overflow bins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're we're continually seeing scenes uh, out of Ireland where there's a lot of unruly behaviour going on right now uh, the guard are being called in, kids jumping on cars, destroying property. They're now talking about, you know, summer drinking. The The Atlantic had a piece uh, at the start of June talking about America has a drinking problem. <laughs> and I was uh, just going to bring that up. alcohol problem, yeah, yeah, right? I was just going to bring that up. And, it, and it's kind of interesting. I'm, I'm looking around right now and, and it feels like the summer of of alcohol being pulled out into the harsh light of day and disgust and and i think you and i are fortunate we are we're in the single cask business mm-hmm. you know you know 15 year olds aren't getting their hands on our hooch and drinking it to excess and mm-hmm. and, and getting unruly but but it is interesting even the idea of lockdown drinking where a number of people who didn't normally take solace in alcohol have upped their home drinking. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm curious, and I'm glad you were about to bring up the, the Atlantic as well, but I'm curious on what you're thinking as you're looking around and you're seeing alcohol being front and centre in a number of, of stories. Part of me wonders how much of this is actually a story and how much of it is a story trend that people are picking up on. Like, I, I, there are things going on, right? That every action has a reaction. The things going on in Scotland, I remember reading about that. I didn't hear about the the Ireland thing, but I, I just wonder how much of an increase we're seeing, and is it so much of an increase that it warrants what we're talking about here, or is it just becoming a slightly larger story that has well, only been made larger because now it's become clickworthy. Well, and it, and it also seems to be connected to frustration and letting off steam, right? <laughs> we are, yes. You know, on, on, on one hand, people are really done with lockdown. People want to go back to being in clubs at the weekend and being in bars mm-hmm. and dining indoors. And in the absence of that, you see frustrations. What I would say, though, is I think we've gone from, you know, gosh, if you look at any major city on a Friday night and a Saturday night, they're war zones, absolute war zones. They're frightening, frightening places with the youth and they're drinking and they're fighting and they're mm-hmm. taking to the streets. I think what we're seeing right now is these images are coming out on a Tuesday, you know, <laughs> and it's the summer. So the yeah. nights are lighter, longer. And so you're seeing it 
in blazing colour right in front of you. Yeah. It's not happening at 1am or 2am after the clubs have let out. It's happening at 10pm when, for parts of Europe, the sun is still up. Mm. And so, I, 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 you know, I'm, 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 I'm kind of curious as I'm following this. I, I don't think behaviour has necessarily, necessarily changed, but I think our viewing of it plus everybody has a camera on on the device that they carry around All in their the pocket. Yes. Right? Yes. And so there's nothing not being seen. You know, I think virtually every incident that's happening on a plane is being seen, right? All, all these you know, singular moments of crazy are being captured and they look like a broader kind of pattern of crazy. When, yeah, all, when maybe all, it's not quite that bad. Exactly. All you need is a... a- a couple of pictures and a and a headline, right? I, I was hoping you were going going to go with all oh, you need is love. <laughs> yeah, you know it. I, I think a lot of this, the uptick that we're seeing, whether whether it's on planes or it's in parks or, or anything like that, there is a bit of that letting off of steam and i think I, I think we are going to see things bubble up right i read an article about how there there are some cities where people are getting out and into clubs again and parting it up like it was the end of prohibition mm. right mm-hmm. you know it reminds me of any any time my kids clean the room i go in there and i start walking around and i wave my arms around saying look what I'm able to do. I wasn't able to do this before because your room was so messy and now I can do this. It's the same <laughs> thing, right? It's, 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 look what we can do and then, and then it'll come back. But as news story begets news story begets news story, it becomes far bigger than it likely is. And... Yeah, it looks like a global pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so let's let's wrap it here, take a very quick break and come back with something a little lighter in the second half. Beautiful. out by saying we had a couple of stories for this episode where neither one was a full episode but there were things we wanted to bring up and so mm-hmm. I'm really glad we got to bring up the the subject of alcohol <laughs> and how it's being used and what it's looking like. Here's, here's something of a very different colour. The story is from May 31, 2021 authored by Leslie Wu for Forbes, Mm -hmm. and I can say I did turn off my ad blocker for this article, and when I did that, the article disappeared because it was replaced by ads, but I have it back, and this title, (laughs) as soon as I saw this title, I absolutely had to bring this into Extra Extra. Okay. Working dogs can sniff out flaws in whiskey and wine barrels. Ah, I just did vision these dogs walking the streets at night, street corners, working dogs. Oh, wait, oh, oh, these are different. <laughs> too kind much of makeup, dogs. Yeah, too much makeup, <laughs> bustiers. You know the whole thing. These are these are very different kind of working dogs. Uh, okay. So Leslie writes, those who spend time in whiskey distilleries in the past may have encountered a furry friend or two. Diligent distillery cats making the rounds on the prowl for rodents attracted to the barley. Hmm. Although the role of these mousers may have shifted over the years, some achieved fame beyond their lifespan through naming rights to dedicated bottlings, most notably Glen Turret's Towser Cask Whiskey, which memorialised a Guinness World Record holding cat who caught 28,899 mice during her 24 years at the distillery. There's no way there was a running tally. There's just no way. Somebody said, if that cat catches, you know, X number of mice a year, and it's been doing for 24 years, how many mice do you reckon it's captured? I'd say 28,900, maybe maybe 30,000. How about 28,899? 
Yep, sold. Wait, hold on. Just just really quickly. 28,000. Let's just call it 29,000. And and how <laughs> old is this cat? 24 years at the distillery. Divided by 24. That means on average it's catching 1200 mice. What's going on at Glen Turret that there are 1200 mice being picked off a year? A year. So that's 100 a month. So that's about 3 a day. Oh, okay. Okay, you know what? When you break it down like that, <laughs> it's just what are you gonna do, right? And then whatever, and then whatever three is divided by twenty-four would even let you know how many an hour, and it's point something an hour. Like it, cl- it caught close to zero every hour, and ended up with twenty-nine thousand for a career. Amazing, amazing, amazing how math works. Anyway, continue. Now, an eighteen-month-old pup named Rocco is giving a new connotation to nosing whiskey. He's helping Associate Global Brand Director, parentheses, and human, Chris... (laughs) You laughed in the wrong place. (laughs) That's kind of funny, though, that they have to... This person's also human. And human. Yeah, but do you want to know the name of the human? Oh, please. This, this, it's beyond perfection. Chris Woof. (laughs) <laughs> W-O-O-F Two F's Oof. Wow, amazing Chris Woof yeah. <laughs> That's kismet <laughs> Like he can only have the one job To work alongside a mousing dog <laughs> well, So he's not a mousing dog We haven't got to his role yet Oh, well, please don't let me get in the way Yeah So Rocky is helping Chris Woof Sniff for flaws in the Grant's Whiskey Distillery in Girvan, Scotland. Hey! And then we've got a quote from Woof. (laughs) No, no, Woof's the human. Rocco's the dog. Continue, continue, yep. (laughs) The sense of smell of a dog like Rocco is 40 times stronger than a human's. Mm -hmm. And we have specially selected and trained Rocco to pick up the scent of anything that's not quite right as the whiskey matures. See, that's the part I want to know more about. Like, what's the not quite right part? Like, tell me more there. Yeah, yeah. What are are the parameters that they set up for Rocco? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, so this is this is a quote to the Daily Record, which was my my father's paper of record, oh, <laughs> paper of go. choice. And so the quote continues: Mechanical noses are widely used in the winemaking industry, but we wanted to maintain the tradition of our craft skills by using a dog's natural super sense of smell in our quality control process. I do like the use of tradition there when they've trained a dog to do it. <laughs> Traditionally, we haven't used machinery. Rocco, whew, yeah, boy. <laughs> Rocco. <laughs> I'm just, I'm curious what these robot wine noses are. <laughs> like, is there some robot this, army? Some robot army? This, this article is raising more questions than it's answering. <laughs> so, so we're about to get a Who is the author from- again? Isaac Asimov? <laughs> Schrodinger's dog <laughs> Completely <laughs> unrelated According to trainer Stuart Phillips mm-hmm. At BWY K9 Training in Wales hmm. The process took over eight months Using cask samples and other methods <laughs> Other methods, I can only imagine Oh my gosh, my mind goes to beatings, right? And other methods. If you don't select a good cask this time, Rocco. (laughs) Yeah, they hit him with a copy of the Daily Record. (laughs) Press the nose. Bad dog, bad dog. And Rocco learned the ropes alongside another Cocker Spaniel Hmm. brand for the secretive project. And now here, here is the quote. This is a quote from the BWI website. Okay. Should Rocco identify any casks, then Rocco's new handler will inform staff at the cooperage who can place the casks to one side 
and not be used in the whisky making process. What exactly Rocco and Bran have been trained to sniff out remains confidential. Hmm. There you go. But whiskey drinkers can be assured that the dogs are helping to identify imperfections in the wooden casks, ensuring that the quality of whiskey produced remains at the exceptionally high standard expected by the whiskey maker and the consumers purchasing bottles of whiskey. Hmm. And and so it, to me, it sounds like it's a cask selection process for wood that will be used for maturation. That's but in this yeah. but in this article, it has talked about and maybe rightly, maybe wrongly, about the dog being trained to select maturing casks of whiskey that are not maturing according to set standards. That one seems a little trickier to me than just selecting the cast that will be used for maturation. And, and the way the last paragraph or few sentences were written, that's how I understood it too, that, that, it's, that it's a quality assurance of the casks about to be filled with spirit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Let's see if there's more info here. Both dogs were trained to deal with elements of a busy distillery, including, quote, loud noises, people working and machinery operating, walking on different and difficult floor surfaces, end quote, and underwent search and indication training in preparation, according to Business Daily. Using dogs to sniff out imperfections in casks has been tried before. In 2019, Tennessee Coopers, a cooperage in Chile, Tennessee Coopers <laughs> in Chile. So here, so let me, so I maybe did a little American autofill here. It's T.N. Coopers and then a cooperage in Chile. Ah, uh, okay. So yeah, T -N, T.N. And so for, for international listeners, T.N. is the state abbreviation for Tennessee. Mm -hmm. You talk about whiskey, you put up T.N., I autofill Tennessee yep, on that. Yep, so. So T.N. Coopers, a Cooperage in Chile, brought a team of dogs on board to hunt down TCA, TBA, and other compounds potentially contaminating the wood and wine barrels. Oh, now, we're, now we're cooking. Mm -hmm. Quote, the underlying principle is that dogs have a much wider olfactory threshold than humans mm -hmm. and thus can detect very small concentrations of specific compounds just by their sense of smell. T.N. Cooper's marketing manager, Guillermo Calderon, told Wine Spectator. <laughs> there we go. A couple more paragraphs and then we're out of here. Although the dogs have a serious job, they also apparently lighten the mood considerably with their fuzzy presence. Wine Spectator recently released its issue devoted to winery dogs who bring wagging tails and happy spirits to vintners and, vi and vi visitors across California. And then the only reason I read that is because I saw they were going to close out by referencing Rocco. Rocco, who has his own kennel at the distillery and is considered a member of the team, quote, the atmosphere lifts whenever Rocco is working and people can't help but smile in his presence. Leanne Noble, the Grant's team leader in charge of Rocco's care, told the Daily Record, he's a working dog rather than a workplace pet. So we have guidelines in place to make sure he doesn't get disturbed when he's taking a break between shifts. He's out back smoking a cigarette. <laughs> oh, reading the daily record. Oh, what's going on in the world today? Oh, these kids and their booze. Oh, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Sorry, he's Welsh. <laughs> Whose trainers are these sneakers? Uh, he's a, a working dog. Terrible uh, Welsh uh, accent. An absolute it was rushed. Terrible. It was rushed. Uh, in place to make sure he doesn't get disturbed when he's taking a break. But the boost in morale has been a joy to see. So at the end of the day, it sounds like Rocco's been brought in in search of organoleptic compounds. And mm -hmm. it certainly sounds like cast selection. I do also wonder if it might continue during maturation. If it wasn't picked up in the very early stages, but it's perhaps built during maturation, I wonder if a trained dog could then identify that. For our listeners that don't know the term organoleptic, that just rolled right off your tongue, can you? I say it every day. Can you? Can you clue us in? Yeah, organoleptic. It's just those organic compounds that you would find in a in a food or in a liquid 
that somehow trigger your your senses. Okay. In this instance, for the dog, smell. In our instances, smell and taste. So. Okay. Um, That's an interesting little project. Were there, were there any quotes from Rocco? Not in this article. In this article. Yeah. I'll tell you, I I find this one interesting. Um, you know, you you and I both have smelled casks before they've been filled. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember smelling some when we were in Spain, smelling some some emptied sherry casks, and you smell for that because you're looking for a bit of sulfur, right? You're looking for what's the stuff you don't want in there, and. And I guess it makes sense, right? That A, a dog has a better sense of smell. There's no doubt about it. But but B, because they have that, what a money saver it would be. Like if you're putting spirit into cask and letting it sit there for 10, 12 years. <laughs> and there's that spirit gone to waste or, or had to be blended out into something, right? It, it's, it's, it's a really interesting... Uh, approach. I, I agree with you. And, and that's what's interesting to me is the idea of the pre-selection, but then the continuing mm. inspection mm-hmm. where even if it wasn't there to begin with, did it go, quote unquote, off at some point in the process? Um, and to, you know, even if it wasn't there to begin with and you went ahead and used the cask to discover it at three years or five years or seven years, yeah is better than discovering it at 12 years or 13 years. <laughs> You're still saving time in there. And especially with wood at a premium, space at a premium, and liquid at a premium. If you're sitting there with a cask that's not going to be used for you know a, a specific distillery purpose, mm. you want to know sooner rather than later that that's the case. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out the logistics of it, at least for the the sniffing of the casks after they had been filled with liquid, because there's so many warehouses that are that are dunnage, right? So you, you, you're you're putting these casks three levels high. If you want to get to that bottom level, you've got to take off levels one and you know the the, the top and the center layer. For them to smell it, and then you've got racked warehousing and palletized warehousing. You know, initially when when I was thinking about a job's dog to smell these casks, again, this is the second half after the liquid has been matured in cask. I was thinking about Glen Murray. You know, they've got over a hundred thousand casks in their warehouse. How could a dog do that? And then I thought back to the to the mousing cat. You know. <laughs> that can kill three mice a day. And, and those numbers then add up very quickly, right? Just let the dog sniff 12 casts a day for, you know, and, and, and you're golden. But the logistics of breaking down warehoused casks makes this project seem much more difficult on the back end than it is mm. from the mm-hmm. outset of smelling yeah. the casks as they come in before they get filled with your spirit. Yeah, and, and I wonder, and I'm sure the, the, you know big distilleries and, and certainly you know, huge organisation like Grants would would likely know this. What are the percentage of casks that quote unquote go off during maturation compared to the number of casks that come in that shouldn't have been used to begin with, right? And if that's the point at which you get the dog involved, you could take a number of problematic casks out of circulation yeah. with with much easier logistics. You and I have seen, you know, empty cask deliveries that sit in a yard and you can have access to every single one. Every single one gets rolled into a filling station. Like they're they're very much individual units at that point mm. before they then go off into a warehouse filled and they become a lot more anonymous at that point. Well, the last thing that I'll th- I'll throw in here is, if done properly, I think the this could actually be a a very straightforward process. So I'm thinking back to my days when I used to run a stock room for uh, at, at an assembly plant. Now this is back in the in the the early '90s. In fact, I was working at this place when uh, 
Kurt Cobain killed himself. So it gives you an idea of the, of the time frame, right? There and we and we would have spot checks, and our spot check regimen was around thirty three percent of the product going out. And so my mm. point is, if you're running a dunnage warehouse that's stacking three high, and you sniff everything at the beginning, <laughs> and then you mature it at the end, just make sure the ones you're spot checking are the ones on the top. Then it becomes yeah. a much easier job. So so it is definitely doable if you use simple inventorying practices. That's interesting. That's really interesting. Yeah, I thought that was a lovely little story, and I thought it was a, a very different kind of story. I'm definitely off to research TCA, TBA, and other compounds potentially contaminating the wood and wine barrels. That has certainly captured my attention this day. But we better get out of here. Mm -hmm. If you, dear listener, would like to drop us a note, just use the the age-old email address, questions at one nation under whiskey.com. No E in whiskey. We do always love hearing from you. And until next time, I'm Jason. Oh. You're Joshua. Yes, yeah, so and the last thing I'll say is we have the story that Richard Baum brought to us that we need <laughs> yes, we to I was get thinking to. That, we need to get to. I was to. thinking that 30 seconds ago. Yep, yep. So, okay. So, again, uh, a second apology to the previous. <laughs> this is a follow-up apology to Richard from our first <laughs> apology. <laughs> yep. Yep. We, we still have it. We haven't done anything with that either. That's very, so. very true. Okay, Joshua. All until right, next Jason. time, my friend. Until then. Cheerios. Two cheers. Two cheers. <laughs> <Later>. <laughs>